The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Will you please rise for the opening sentences? Let us worship God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Lo, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week and gather at your house of prayer, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that united with Christ and with all the faithful, we may one day enter in triumph the city not made by human hands, the new Jerusalem, eternal in the heavens, where with you and the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in glory forever. Amen. The triumphal entry from the Gospel of Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had told them, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went, he went out, out to, to Bethany, Bethany with, with the twelve. The 12. <laughs>
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, we ask for you to come upon us to fill our hearts and minds that as your word is read and proclaimed, we may be led deeper into faith for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. The 50th chapter, verses 4 through 9a. Hear now God's word. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together who are my adversaries, let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 31.
tears have wasted my eyes, my throat, and my heart. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighs. Affliction has broken down my strength, and my bones waste away. face of all my foes, I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends. Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like the dead, forgotten by all, like a thing thrown away. the slander of the crowd, fear is all around me, as they plot together against me, as they plan to take my life. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord, I say you are my God. My life is in your hands, deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your love. O Lord, you are my God. I trust in Today's epistle lesson comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality as God, with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the word of the Lord. The gospel is a gospel reading is from Mark, the 15th chapter, the Passion Narrative of Our Lord. As soon as it was, uh, was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. 
Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to the custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him to the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage before him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to be crucified. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, In the same way, the chief priest, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others who cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. 
Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, saw where the body was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Hopes rise and hopes fall, we all know that. On this day in Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago, the hopes of a people long subjected by foreign oppressors once again rose in expectation. As Jesus made his way into the city, he was met by an impromptu celebration that quickly turned into a parade. People lined the streets and throwing their cloaks and leafy branches on his path Running behind him and before him, they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It was a fervent and heartfelt plea. What those who greeted him hoped was that he would bring at last deliverance from a life humiliated by subjugation to the to the kingdom of Rome and the restoration of the golden age of David's kingdom in Israel. I imagine, though, that Jesus didn't look all that regal sitting astride that donkey, maybe even a little, a little ridiculous. And perhaps that should have tipped them off that this one who would prove to be just one more disappointment and a string of disappointments. Sometimes, though, even the slightest chance for a change can give rise to hope. A modest improvement in the condition of a loved one who has lingered for weeks at death's door. The chance, just the chance, of an interview with a potential employer for a job suited to your qualifications. An unexpected thank you, and maybe even a hug from a delightful child somehow turned sullen teenager. But even as hopes rise, they may also fall. Light turns to darkness, joy to disappointment, and what a disappointment Jesus turned out to be for the people of Jerusalem. By Thursday of that same week, one of his inner circle would betray him to his enemies. He would be arrested and charged with sedition on Fridays. His followers would desert him, and in the end, only his mother and a couple of other women would have the courage, the sheer courage to stand within shouting distance of his cross. By Friday afternoon, he was dead, stone cold dead. Just one more victim of Roman-style justice. All of it, all of it had come to naught. To be honest, Jesus disappoints us as well sometimes. He says to forgive, and you do. But the one you forgave wrongs, wronged you all over again. He says to give, and it will be given to you, and so you give your time, your trust, your love, your energy, and your money, but you discover that there is not always a receiving in kind. He says to speak truth, but you discover that the truth is not always what others want to hear. A lie would be far more appealing. He says to pray, and so you do. You pray for healing. You pray for courage, for insight, for understanding, for all sorts of things. But sometimes after a while you begin to wonder if the only one who hears the words of your prayers is yourself. He calls you to follow, and you do. But then the way in which he leads you sometimes makes no sense, no sense at all. You see, there isn't always an in-kind return. So it was for the 12 men who walked with Jesus into Jerusalem that day. 
They fully expected places of honor and power and prestige in the coming kingdom that he was to establish in Jerusalem. None of them, none of them ever expected that it would come to this, to this cross, to this defeat, to this utter shame and humiliation. Looking back, they should have known. He had been warning them of this all along the way. But they did not hear, or maybe did not want to hear. They shared the same eager hope as those who welcomed him to the city with shouts of Hosanna. But that hope was now utterly crushed by the events of Good Friday. It was only later, after the grief of Thursday night, the horror of Friday, and the empty silence of, sun, of Saturday had been eclipsed by the brightness of Sunday's dawn, that they began to put the pieces together, and they began to understand a little bit at a time. The paradox of the cross, you see, is that it represents not the death of hope, but the very birth of hope. For it is only beyond the cross that the promise of resurrection to new life comes to light. It is only beyond our death to the values and priorities of this world that we can begin to embrace and be embraced by the values and priorities of the kingdom of God which is life shared with God in Jesus Christ. We understand that theologically. We may even glory in the old rugged cross. But if the truth be told, you and I find the week that lies before us a troubling one to travel. And the cross that stands at the end of it, an offensively enigmatic symbol of the meaning of Christian faith and discipleship. We are tempted, sorely tempted, to jump from the pomp and circumstance with which we have clothed the triumphal entry to Easter's glorious shout, the Lord is risen, without ever having stood in the shadow of the cross. A bumper sticker I remember reading asked, if it's not fun, why do it? And in many ways, I think that summarizes the prevailing sentiment of our culture, even the religious culture. Much of the Christianity served up in the contemporary American church is the feel-good, happy variety. Its focus is on the comfort and satisfaction of the consumer who sits in the pew. Sermons focus on self-improvement and quality of life issues. Preachers avoid reference to sin and evil, suffering and sacrifice, unless it is someone else's suffering and sacrifice, and unless it is a sin and evil that they assume are far from the reality of their listeners' lives. The expectation is that those who come to worship should have such an experience that they will leave church feeling better than they did when they came. And that happens. It happens frequently for me. But ultimately, it is not all about you. It's not all about me. We live in a have-it-your-way culture. It's a world of quick fixes, easy solutions, and immediate gratification. It's a culture that not only tells you that you can have it all, but that you deserve it all. The way to that satisfaction the world holds out as our due is through the accumulation of things, of experiences, of whatever may be your heart's desire at the moment. It is as we draw these things to ourselves, we are told, that we will find the way, the life for which we yearn. By contrast, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, holds up a cross as the symbol of the Christian's way of life and the way to 
full or eternal life. You see, the gospel never promises that when we follow Jesus, our lives will always be fun or even that they should be fun. The gospel does not promise that we will always feel fulfilled. What the gospel does promise is that it is in following Jesus and taking up our own cross that we discover a sense of meaning, of purpose, of direction in life, which leads to life. St. Paul calls us to Christ's example in these words, which may well have been a part of an early Christian hymn. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being form, born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the mind that Paul admonishes those who would follow Jesus to have within them and among them. The way to life is not in protecting it, but in risking it. Not in hoarding it, but giving it away in service to others. Not in trying to save yourself, but by trusting God to save you as you give yourself to discerning and doing the will of God. Simply put, the way to life is through the cross. Like the people who greeted Jesus in Jerusalem, we can be spectators along the way who cheer him on in the hope that he will fulfill our highest hopes, or we can fall into line behind him, walk in his steps, live in his light, and so discover that that hope is fulfilled within us reaches far beyond that which we originally desired. Each of you received a palm frond when entering the sanctuary this morning. At least I hope you got one. I want to invite you to take it home with you today. Put it in a place where you can see it during this holy week and let it serve as a reminder of both the price and the promise of following Jesus. Put it where you can see it and remember. To God be glory now and forever. Amen.
Let us affirm what we believe using historic words of our faith. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Redeemer suffered death, was buried, and rose again for our sake. With love, let us adore him, aware of our needs. Christ, our teacher, for us you were obedient even to death. Christ, our life, by dying on the cross, you destroyed the power of evil and death. Christ, our strength, you were despised and humiliated as a condemned criminal. Christ, our salvation, you gave your life out of love for us. Christ, our Savior, on the cross you embraced all time with your outstretched arms. Jesus, Lamb of God, Jesus, bearer of our sins, Jesus, Redeemer of the world. Eternal God, as we are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, so give us the grace of repentance that we may pass through the grave with him and be born again to eternal life. For he is the one who was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose again for us, Jesus our Savior. The peace of Christ be with you. Please share the peace. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this gathering of God's people here at Memorial Presbyterian Church on this Sunday when we begin our journey into Holy Week. I'd invite all of you to sign the friendship registers as they're passed down the pews at this time, and I would call your attention to all of the announcements in the bulletin inserts. We will not have a Wednesday feast dinner this Wednesday. The children's choirs are rehearsing, however. On Thursday, though, at 7 p.m., we will come together as God's people in Jesus Christ to share in a Maundy Thursday service which will include the celebration of our Lord's Supper. On Good Friday, you're invited to join us here at noon for a community Good Friday service. We will be welcoming uh, brothers and sisters from other congregations in our community to share with us in that service. So I hope you'll be with us at noon on Friday. And then join us as we celebrate the gift of the resurrection on Easter with one of three services, or three if you'd like. Uh, they, at 6.30, there will be a garden service that's sponsored by the Faith at Five community. 
At 8.30 and 11, there will be uh, festive services of, of worship in the sanctuary, and hope that you'll choose to be a part of one of those, as well as the uh, free breakfast or brunch that is supplied in Fellowship Hall, courtesy of various ministries of the church, between the 8.30 and 11 o'clock service. Please note, too, the Easter lily form and also the MPC Youth Flamingo Flocking Fundraiser. Mary and I are looking forward to seeing some of our friends in the congregation flocked in the next week, and uh, I hope that you will join in flocking your friends as well or paying insurance so that you may or may not get flocked. Let us bring to God our tithes and our offerings.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And in unison we pray, saying, Great God, we thank you for Jesus, who was punished for our sins and suffered shameful death to rescue us. We praise you for the trust we have in him, for mercy undeserved, and for the love you pour out on us and on us all. Give us gratitude, O God, and a great desire to serve you by taking our cross and following the way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And we continue praying using the prayer that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of, of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.